Acts chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. We'll see how far we get. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who had sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You didn't know that Peter was from Kentucky, did you? In the presence of y'all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you, and it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken have also foretold these days you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying to Abraham and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed to you first God having raised up his servant Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities Peter and John are on the way to the temple and it says at the hour of prayer The Jews observed really three times of prayer. In our time, it would have been 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and then in the the evening just before sunset. So three times. And devout Jews would have done that. And even Gentiles who believed in God uh, went to the temple at these times to pray. So they're on the way to the temple. Why would new Christians... Why would they still be observing Jewish customs of times to pray and going to the temple? So why would Peter and John be on the way to the temple at the normal time that Jewish people would be going there? Isn't something different? Aren't they Christians? What's going on? Any thoughts? Why would they do that? Maybe they went there to convert them. I think that's actually a good thought. Any other thought? Well, I hope they went to pray. That's what it says. They were on, they were on the way to the temple. It doesn't say they were going to pray, but that's what we assume. I think maybe it's faithfulness. Maybe they just continued to pray. They, have that, they had that custom, and it's not that they're just following Jewish customs and traditions, but maybe they're 
just being devout. Maybe they're just being faithful to do that. That they probably knew that they would encounter a lot of Jewish people and that maybe they would get the opportunity to witness. Uh, We don't know. It is possible that they knew that they would meet this man who had been lame all of his life. It's very possible that they could have known that because every day he laid there. He was brought there. And so when, when you look at this, I wonder, you know, how many times do we think about going somewhere with the intent purpose of witnessing or the intent purpose of praying for someone? Isn't that a thought? That they're on their way. Uh, maybe it's not the exact time that th- there's no set Christian time for, for prayer, but maybe they, uh, they're looking at, it, at this as an opportunity an opportune time to pray. And this man is laying at the temple at the gate called Beautiful. Now, it is not a gate to the city. It's the gate to the temple. And this gate is, I think I read the description of it. I know it was was made out of brass. So it is literally a very beautiful gate, a very tall gate. And he's laying outside of that, which means he had no entry, no way to get to the temple. So he couldn't get to God but God got to him. Uh, so you, you, you see this going on. He's at the temple uh, gate, can't get in, and this gate is everyone's favored entrance. There were so many people that came this way to go to a place of worship, and he would have been seen by almost everybody, this man would have. And he laid there begging. And during this time, and I'm, I'm going to give you some knowledge that I didn't know till I studied it. In Rome, they would have had a special coat, a special outfit for him to wear if they had been in Rome. I don't know if they had this same thing where they're at, but the Romans are ruling. And it let people know that this man is legit. How many ever saw somebody on the side of the road begging and you wondered, is this legit or am I being deceived? So they would have specific garments that were sanctioned by the government so that people would know that this is a legitimate thing that you can give to this cause. Uh, I just found that interesting as I was studying that. So here is the lame beggar asking for money. He's, He's asking for Peter and John specifically. I think either they catch his eye or he catches their eye. And he's asking them for money. He's asking them for something less than what he actually receives. I wonder how many times we ask God for less than what he really wants to give to us. I really think there's a principle here of asking big things of God, not little things. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask little things. Even the Lord's prayer that he teaches to the disciples to pray says, to ask for your daily bread. But I believe that there's also a principle here of asking not just little things. How many knows we have big, a great, big, awesome, mighty, powerful God? If we look at it that way, then he ends up getting something much better. He ends up getting healed. His, not healed. Actually, the term is a miracle. Because healed would have mean that he would slowly have been able to gain strength in his legs and be able to stand and walk and leap and praise God like it talks about. But it wasn't healing. It was miraculous. It was instantaneous that he was able to do that. So we have just a, a mighty, powerful uh, miracle here where the, the man uh, is able to, to walk and to leap. And he had been laying there for uh, a long time. And all of the people knew what, who he was. They recognized him. What a powerful opportunity for God to move and for people to to get saved. I mean, it's just a a great, uh, tremendous opportunity. What's the first thing that Peter says? Look on us. He did say that. We like that other part. I don't have any money. We see that the disciples continue to pray. Here, Peter says, look on us. And he says, silver and gold I don't have. Silver and gold I don't have. But 
what I do have, I give to you, right? There was a story that I read this week, and I thought it's a great illustration. And it is, uh, it is about actually a pope, a Catholic pope, and he's walking with a monk, and they're traveling, and this is during a time when the Catholic church was at its peak. I mean, how many knows the Catholic church is already a very powerful organization, and probably it is still one of the richest organizations in the world now, own property after property. And so this monk is walking with the Pope, and the Pope says, we can no longer say silver and gold, have we not? And the monk said, yes, and we can also no longer say, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So what was missing was the power. They didn't have the power either, right? Uh, So I thought that was a great story. It would be better for us not to have money, but to have the power to be able to speak life into somebody and to raise somebody up and, 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 and then be able to walk. So many times we look at not having any money as a is just the worst thing that could possibly happen, but that's not what Peter and John thought about that, obviously. So they were able to uh, give him something that was worth a whole lot more, uh, and it was, it was powerful. They said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now that's the declaration. You do this. Now look at the next thing that happens. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. That was an action of faith. So Peter is saying, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have is the power in the name of Jesus. And then instead of just saying that, how many knows that sometimes we say things, but we don't demonstrate the power of God. And so he reaches and begins to help the man to stand up. And so that's that statement of faith and that uh, action of faith as he begins uh, to lift him up out of that situation. Many times in the Bible, the right hand refers to authority. So they had the authority. You know, they're, they're, they're using that power and that authority, really, that Christ had given to them before even the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon them because they had gone out and healed and set people free from demons and all kinds of things like that, even before, by just by the example that Christ had given to them, even before that right hand is always a symbol of authority. It does have significance in, in, in that. In the name of Jesus. They were very specific about the name of Jesus, weren't they? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So they didn't want anybody to have any confusion about who this was. Why? Because the name Jesus is actually was actually a very, I shouldn't say very, but it was a familiar name. There were other people named Jesus at that time. So they wanted to be very specific that it was in the power and the authority and the name of Jesus Christ and the one that they were witness to. You'll see that a little bit later on, that he had resurrected from the dead whenever we look at the the sermon that Peter preaches. So what does the lame man do? He leaped, walked, praised God. He, I, I, I'm going to say he acted a little bit Pentecostal. What do you think about that? He got excited, wouldn't you? I mean, imagine. For decades, never able to walk, always had to be carried here. And what you knew was that you might get enough to just be able to eat. And so here this man is. He's healed. Uh, he's excited. And he knows who to praise. He knows to praise God because. They have told him that it's in the name of Jesus and by that authority uh, that this miracle is, is taking place. So he began to leap, jump around. And what, what was the reaction of the people? They were amazed. They were amazed. Why? Well, they did think that they had done it. But also it was just such a great miracle, right? Because they knew who this was. They knew it wasn't a fake. 
They knew that it wasn't something that was put on. They knew it wasn't, uh, you know, uh, just something that was made up. So uh, they were standing there in awe, and then they, what did they do? They ran to see what was going on. They went over uh, to check out the situation. And then what did Peter, the good preacher, do? Started preaching. He used the opportunity. I want to stop right here. How many of us are presented with opportunities, but we don't use it? Do you realize you're a preacher? I'm not the only preacher in here. That we're all called to preach the word of God and to uh, witness. And so now I have a distinct call on my life, but you do too. We're all witnesses. We're all called to witness to people that they would be saved. Peter uses this opportunity and the audience that he had. I believe God gives us audience with people. And sometimes it is in a strange situation. How many ever got an opportunity to witness some, to somebody in just a kind of a strange situation or unique situation? Maybe it was even a bad situation, maybe at a hospital, if you were visiting somebody that you got to witness to somebody else. Have you ever had that kind of situation happen in your life? Because God gives us audience, but sometimes I wonder, do we really recognize that? I have a little prayer that I like to pray, and I'd like to say I pray it 100% of the time. I'm not sure that I always do that, but I like to pray, God, give me divine encounters. And I could stop right there. And I would probably get divine encounters, but I also pray and help me to recognize them. Because I believe that almost daily, now I don't I don't know that for you, but I believe almost daily that we get audience with people, and sometimes we just don't take advantage of that and and, and begin to witness to people. And so so he gains audience and he capitalizes on the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them. Colossians 5, 4. So we're called on a little, a little further on, maybe in that same scripture, I think it is, called on us to give, be able to give that explanation, right, uh, of our hope. That may be another scripture. But anyway, I think it's, it's right in there. So we're also called on to be able to explain the reason why we have the hope that we have. So uh, we're uh, called on to take advantage of the opportunity. Now look at the message that Peter preaches. It's contained there in verses 11 through 19. When Peter saw it, he responded to the people, why do you marvel at this? So what he instantaneously is doing is saying, this is not our miracle. We didn't do this. It's not something that uh, we had the power to do. But he begins to say that it's the, the power of God, and he describes God, the very God that you serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that is the God of our fathers, glorified who? Glorified Jesus. So if we're called to be witnesses, what are we witnesses of? Who Jesus is. Okay? So the first thing that we are witness of, and the first thing that Peter does here, is he tells who Jesus is. Because if you don't tell who Jesus is, first of all, they may think you're taking credit for it. But also, you got to get to the point. Who are we talking about here? If you're witnessing to somebody or preaching to someone, if you want to call it that way, then the first thing you have to do is tell them who Jesus is. Uh, It's important to get to that. It's important, and Peter does that. He tells who Jesus is, and then he begins to tell them how they had rejected him. This is a great salvation message, let me tell you, because he tells them who Jesus is, and we got to do, do that too. And even if you don't know enough, you feel like you don't know enough Scripture to share who Jesus is with somebody, it really doesn't take a whole lot. One of the verses that you probably see every time you turn on the TV, if you watch football games, somebody's holding up a sign out in the audience that says what? John 3.16. Tim Tebow, when he was playing, all you had to do was look in the, what is it called, the blackout, and he had John 3.16 in, in them at times. So 
uh, to know who Jesus is. But the other thing about telling them who Jesus is is not just Scripture. How many knows that people might be put off a little bit? Well, I don't know that. I haven't heard that. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But when you begin to tell people who Jesus is based upon what he's done for you, then you've caught their attention. So it's important uh, that we tell people who Jesus is. That's what he does here when he's preaching. How they had rejected him. Man, he's confrontational. He says, this Jesus that God glorified, you killed him. Wow. Like he wasn't pulling any punches. He wasn't just stepping on their toes. He was saying, you're guilty, right? You rejected him. He began to tell them how that they, uh, when they rejected Jesus Christ, that it was a fatal decision, that they were they would, they would die in their sins if they remained in that state. But he does go on to say, now, I know you did it out of ignorance. He says, you, you did it out of ignorance. Now, in our day, many times we call people ignorant, and uh, it's taken more offensively than probably it should be. What does ignorant mean? Unlearned. You just don't know, right? You just don't know. It doesn't mean that, that you're, you're uh, stupid. It means that you're ignorant that you're unlearned you haven't heard about it i mean you can't know something if you haven't heard about it right and so here uh peter's telling them that uh you know we know that it was done in ignorance so who is jesus how they had rejected them the issue of rejecting christ which means if you don't change something you'll die in your sins does that sound familiar to people how you witness to somebody now i wouldn't start with this i knew someone who their technique of witnessing to someone was to just come out and tell people you're going to die and go to hell well that's not really effective not if that's the first thing you tell them right first you got to tell them who jesus is that they have rejected christ if they're living in sin then you can tell them that it's, it's fatal. I wouldn't say you're going to die and go to hell, but I would let them know that that is something that they need to change, right? The last thing that uh, Peter does, does is what do they need to do to change the situation? Because everything up to this point is just informing them of the situation. Don't tell people about Jesus and that he forgives and that, he, that they're sinners and then not give them an opportunity to make a, a change, to change the situation, because they, they need to know that. What does he tell them they have to do? Repent. Anything else? Be converted. What does that mean? Change. Converted from one way of thinking to another way of thinking. Converted from one lifestyle to another lifestyle, right? Repent is not just asking for forgiveness. It's literally, the word repent means a change of mind. When you look it up in their uh, original language, that's what it means, a change of mind. So that means, how many knows when you change your mind that your actions follow that, right? Or they should. Just do it, right? Change your mind, that's not the way to go, so I'm going this way, right? Change your ways as well, along with it. So repent and be converted that your sins might be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It is through repentance that we're able to gain access to the presence of the Lord. It talks about refreshing, times of refreshing so that you will have those in the presence of the Lord. So make sure those Those verses 11 through 19 are very uh, important. Verse 13 says, you delivered him up. You had him put on trial. You had him taken to Jerusalem. It says you a whole lot in this. You did it. Why why was that important? (laughs) Yeah, and so that they they know that they are guilty as well, right? Right. and, and honestly, some of these people may very well have, could have been, because of, of the place that they're at, 
uh, and the proximity to Jerusalem, all of that, they could have been, some of them could have been the very people who cried out, crucify him. Now, they did it in ignorance, but they still did it, right? So they were, uh, they were responsible for it. Verse uh, 13 tells us that. One thing I'll say, how many of you have traveled much? You go to different parts of the country, you will notice that some places are much more blunt than we are here. Have you ever traveled up north, northeast, much more blunt typically than we are here? Extreme west coast, much more blunt than we are here. Around here in the southern genteelness, sometimes uh, we sugarcoat it like Betty's talking about. It's not that we're not telling the truth, but we're sure not direct with it. So have we compromised in that as a people? I say as a people of God. Now, we don't want to offend, obviously, but we also, sometimes by not telling people like it really is, then we could be guilty of kind of sugarcoating it, maybe compromising it a little bit, uh, certainly not telling it like it ought to be told, the fullness of the way it ought to be said. Uh, sometimes I think we're, we're guilty of that. And maybe it is because, somewhat, because preachers don't preach a whole lot like that anymore. You have to have love and you can't. Uh, and it does a tone of voice. Uh, and you can say things that are very true to people in love and, and they'll know it's in love. It depends on your character as well. You know, is this a person that is just being mean or is this a person that cares? Uh, Many times when I'm preaching, I'll say, you know, you got a pastor that loves you, but I love you enough to tell you the truth. And so sometimes I wonder, I'm not building myself up and saying that it's difficult to do that. I mean, I like to preach happy messages that everybody loves to hear and gets excited about. But whenever it comes to preaching about sin and the repercussions of sin, that's not always the easiest topic. He did do that. He did, he did tell it like it was. But I, I would say that sometimes if we come across in an accusatory tone as if we're better than everybody else, then that could be very hard to take. But if you emphasize that we've all sinned, we've all come short, we've all now, I've, I've re- only difference between you and you and I, if you're a sinner, is that I've recognized that I need Christ and I repented of my sins and you now he's washed me and, and made me different. It wasn't because of anything within me, right? So that accusatory type attitude, I guess you would call it, uh, can make uh, a difference. But we are called to preach and to teach and to uh, mostly, I think, when it comes to witnessing, Acts 1.8, again, that's the theme verse of the whole book. And it's not only the outline for the whole book, but it is, it's what we're supposed to do. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're to be witnesses. And the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. How many knows that to be true? So with somebody, you, a different person, you may just love on them and honey them and, and be real sweet because the Holy Spirit led you to do that. And you through love, but I can tell you not many times, but I have been led to say, you keep living like this, you're going to die and go to hell. And I don't want you to. I want to see you in heaven when I get there. Now, that's very blunt. It's very true, but it's very blunt, right? Uh, It depends upon the leading of the Holy Spirit and how you do that and where the person is. Uh, The Bible talks about, and I don't know why I'm saying this, but Uh, the Bible talks that some that we rescue from the very fire of hell. And if we sugarcoat it and they never really know that they're truly a sinner, are we going to be held responsible for that? It is a very, uh, I, I think the key is to be led by the Holy Spirit. So maybe we've only preached about heaven and not about hell. So there's no real fear there there's no you you don't hear too many messages i I preached one about a year ago and that heaven and hell are real places right they are real so 
if we don't do that, I believe we'll, help, we'll be held responsible. And there's a, when you say fear, there's a healthy fear, right? There's a fear that is a reverential fear that if I don't make things right with God, then I'm lost out. I'm not going to heaven. I'm not going to the place that Jesus said he had gone to prepare. Very, very important for us to, again, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And, and some people need to understand that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. Verse 15, this is where Peter emphasizes that they, they and the religious leaders killed Jesus and that God brought him back to life and that the apostles were witnesses to that fact. One of the key words in Acts is witness. That's what the apostles were, were witnesses that Jesus had resurrected from the dead, that he had been on the cross, dead, buried, but rose again on the third day. Look at verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So Peter's saying, hey, I'm not receiving the glory for this. The healing of this lame man is because of Jesus and because of the name of Jesus. Through that power and that authority is how he was healed. Using the name of Jesus is not a magical thing. It's not magical, but it is about the authority that Christ has given to us. So it doesn't mean that every time we say in the name of Jesus that the Lord is going to do what we've asked for. I really wish that he would, but it doesn't it is a it is in that power and that authority. And how many knows that God is sovereign? And so sometimes when we pray for people to be healed or for miracles, God is already sovereignly determined that this is what he's going to do. Whether it's to heal them or whether it's to heal them in a different way and take them to heaven, uh, maybe if they're, if they're a Christian, and they, they ultimately get healed in a different way, the best way, because you don't ever get sick again, right? But the name of Jesus, even though we pray in, pray that way, and I think we should, it's still not a magical thing. It's not like saying abracadabra. Because God is sovereign, right? So in that, we, we're praying for God's will when we say, in the name of Jesus. For his will, his power, and his authority. Not just because we've asked for it. It has to be done in faith. Look at verse 18 real quick. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. The Jews, although it was contained in the, in the prophets and all of those kinds of things, did not expect the Messiah to suffer. They expected the Messiah to come in and to set up an earthly kingdom and to rule and take Rome down. So that's why they weren't expecting. That's when uh, Peter said, you did it out of ignorance because they had been taught this even though it wasn't correct. That the, the Messiah, that the Christ wouldn't suffer. So that's... Uh, what verse 18 is about there. Verse 19, repentance. That call to salvation always includes re repentance, acknowledging personal sin, turning away. We talked about that already. Then I like verse 25 there that says, You're the sons of the prophet and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to them, to a, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Peter brings this full circle. He tells them who Jesus is. He tells them of their sin. He tells them that they need to make a change. He gives them the opportunity uh, by explaining to them repentance and salvation. And then he begins to say, hey, I'm going to bring this all the way around and now you're, you, you are going to receive the blessings of God, which you thought you already had, but it comes through Jesus and not through being just a Jew. Absolutely. And we're instructed to, prayer, to pray. God did, it was known to change his mind in the Old Testament. What I was really commenting on was that just saying in the name of Jesus is not 
a magical formula. God's still sovereign, and we don't change it, but God can change it, and he does react and respond to prayer when we, when we pray and responds to faith. You know, when I said he in the Old Testament he would change his mind, uh, how many uh, remember that Moses several times actually said, God said, get out of the way, I'm going to kill them all. And Moses said, now God, if you do that, they're going to say that you couldn't lead these people to the promised land that you said you had for them and that, you know, essentially he's saying, God, everybody knows that you miraculously pulled all these people out of Egypt and you have them on the way to the promised land, but if you kill them now, they're going to think God couldn't do that. And so it says that God repented, that he changed his mind, but it was as a result of prayer. It's interesting that, God, that it says that about God. Any other comment, question that's about his will? Many times we can, there are things that we do know is his will. We can know it's God's will to heal people, but he doesn't do it every time. So we can still say in the name of Jesus, not I hope I, it works, but God, it's still in your authority and your power. It's not about me asking for it, although we're instructed to ask for it. Do we uh, flow in that authority of God? Who really are we, you know, in Christ? Look at your questions real quick. I think most of them we've answered, some of them maybe not, because sometimes I don't emphasize everything that's in the questions there. So after Pentecost, the, 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 did the disciples cease to visit the temple? No. They did not cease to do that. They continued to go at the hour of prayer. It doesn't mean that they were necessarily just following Jewish customs and traditions, although it may just mean they were being devout, but it also may be that it was a great place to go to witness to people who had, you see that when they went to the temple, the Jews already had a base knowledge of God. It's a whole lot easier to take somebody from a base knowledge of God to receiving Christ as their Savior than it is for somebody who knows nothing about any kind of God or that they even are sinners. See, the Jews believe that they sin. They just don't believe that Jesus is the one that was the provision for their sin. Maybe he wasn't serving God, but... It, it's very difficult to witness and win somebody who doesn't believe in a God at all and also who doesn't uh, recognize what I'm going to call original sin. Wow, I didn't know I was going to get into this, but I want to say it really quick, okay? So capture this. In the book of Genesis, the reason why when I preach many times I go from the Old Testament into the New Testament and I explain all of that is because in Genesis... It shows that man originally sinned. What we're at fault in nowadays is that we only preach sometimes, some people only preach out of the New Testament. So therefore, there's no basis that there's original sin. And so why do I need to repent? I haven't done anything wrong. I'm a good person. But Genesis establishes that mankind, no matter what you have done, you were born into sin. So that's the reason why I say if they don't even have that basis, the Jews at least have that basis. Maybe you're right. Maybe it is harder to win somebody else. But they were convinced. A lot of them were convinced. It took a miracle to get their attention, but they were convinced. All right, how many? How did the lame man get to the temple every day? He was carried there. What did Peter first say to the lame man? Look on us. Yeah. What did, what did Peter have? Power and authority in the name of Jesus, right? What did the man do after Jesus made him whole? We talked about that. Stood up, went into the temple. I don't think we talked about that. Walked and leaped and praised God. What was the people's reaction? Ama they were amazed, filled with wonder or amazement. What did Peter tell them that they themselves had done? They had crucified him. They had delivered Christ. Uh, Jesus up, they had denied him uh, in the presence of Pilate and they had killed and had killed the prince of life is what he's called, which is actually one of the answers to the next question. What three titles does Peter give to, to the Lord? 
Holy One, the just, and what? Prince of life. Why did the people do the things that they did to the Lord? They were ignorant. What was Peter's conclusion? Verse 19. Most important part of his sermon. Repent. Be converted that your sins can be blotted out. And from where do our times of refreshing come? From the presence of the Lord. That's like when we had that really great, awesome presence of the Lord here uh, Sunday. And I know he's with us all the time, but there is a difference when you're in a service where it's, um, I will call it a manifest, a very powerful presence of the Lord. It's a time of refreshing, isn't it? I mean, it just you just walk out feeling better uh, than you came in. So how does the Lord bless his people? Verse 26 turns them away from their iniquities and their sins. 